What's up, fight fans? Welcome to Fight Nerds, episode number 13. My name is Flying Brian J, and my co host once again is the live viewers on MMA Mania's Facebook page. If you are there right now and you don't want to listen to the entire show at this moment, you can subscribe to MMA Mania on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Podcast Addict, and pretty much anywhere else where you can possibly find a podcast, you can find MMA Mania. And if we're not there, just tell me about it and I will get us there as soon as possible. So the podcast tonight is only going to happen in two parts, really. Uh, I'm going to go over my picks for UFC 213, the pay-per-view that's not happening this coming Saturday, but on Saturday, July, no, yeah, Saturday, July the 8th. So it's in about a week and a little over a half from right now. I'll give my picks from top to bottom. Starting with Amanda, the Lioness Nunez defending her Women's Bantamweight Championship against a foe who she's already defeated in Valentina Bullet Shevchenko, all the way down to the first fight of the night, which is Tiago de Lima Marreta Santos versus Gerald GM3 Mearshart. So, thank you guys so much for joining me. Below me here, I want you to vote for what pre-fight letter grade you would give the entire fight card of UFC 213. I will say right off the bat that I'm going to give the card an A. Wow, what a stacked event. I already mentioned Nunes, Shevchenko, Bantamweight Championship, but also Yoel, Soldier of God, Romero versus Robert the Reaper Whitaker for the interim middleweight championship. Holy moly. The third fight between Fabricio Verdum and... Alistair, the Ream over Ream. Did I skip the best fight of the card, perhaps? I don't know. Robbie Lawler versus Donald Cowboy Cerrone. What a bunch of fantastic fights on the pay-per-view. And then Pettis Miller. Uh, just the entire fight card is stacked from top to bottom. It's going to be an incredible night of fights. So, without further ado, oh, the first part of the podcast is the picks. The second part is going to be a geeked out side of mixed martial arts. So we'll just talk a little bit about something that I've enjoyed in the past seven days that doesn't involve a mixed martial arts. So let's start with my picks. Amanda, the Lioness Nunes, she is 14-4, and four, the current UFC Women's Bantamweight Championship, taking on Valentina Bullet Shevchenko, who is 14-2. Her only legitimate loss of those two losses was to Amanda Nunes. The other one happened in 2010. It was a TKO loss to Liz Carmouche, which actually was a doctor stoppage stemming from an illegal upkick from Carmouche. So it sh- probably should have been a no contest. I don't know exactly what was going on back in 2010 but anyways she does have a loss to Nunes looking back at the first matchup a lot of people remember it as Nunes dominating the first two rounds and Valentina nearly finishing Nunes in the third that is that's really close to that's really close to true I'm not gonna lie but Valentina was nowhere near finishing Nunes seeing a lot of people in the comments loving on my shirt if you are on the podcast feed right now i'm wearing like zoran zovich zovichek he got the same shirt as me from walmart for five bucks yes it's a teenage mutant ninja turtle shirt that i got at the wally mart for five dollars so since the first fight nunez has really drastically changed her striking up a little and drastically changed her striking. She's also been working on her cardio. In the past, she has been much maligned for having lacking cardio, for going, giving it her all in the first five to ten minutes, perhaps, and then is completely gassing out and having nothing left. Since her last loss to Kat Zingano, she moved to ATT, and she has been really focusing on her cardio and also at not overdoing it when she's looking for the finish like she did against Valentina in the second round of their first fight. If you look at her social media, she's been posting a lot about working on her strength and conditioning and a lot of cardio. So I believe that she is better in that regard. And again, in a first fight with Valentina, people will talk and smack about her gassing out. Man, she was just really going for the finish against Valentina. Perhaps it won't be that way this time. I say that she's way better with her... Adam Wolak says, this guy is horrible. Well, I don't like you that much either, Adam. No, I'm just kidding. Thanks for joining us, Adam. Appreciate you for being here. Nunes has changed her striking since the first matchup. In the first one, she was just 
her first strike would be a winging overhand right, like every single time. And Valentina, the high-level striker that she is, was able to just get out of the way of it every single time just real easily. In Amanda's next fight, uh, and in her last two fights against Tate and Rousey, she was leading with either an inside low kick with her left leg on the lead leg of her opponent, or she was leading with a jab overhand right, and even when she would throw that low kick, then she would go low kick, jab, overhand right, or jab, right straight. So what I'm saying there is she's varying what she's starting with rather than her power shot first. She's not just winging, looping overhand rights naked. She's leading it with the jab first, which I think will behoove her here. In the first fight, she was doing really good with her wrestling. That's where she almost finished. Valentina was on the ground, got her there. Valentina has also been doing some really good stuff to get better and better since that loss to Nunes. She has trained at three separate locations in preparation for this fight, two of them being really highly touted and well-known places, Tiger Muay Thai in Thailand, and then 303 BJJ in Denver, and her primary training partner is Thug Rose Nama Yunus. One thing that's interesting here is Nunes is a huge bantamweight. Shevchenko is a natural bantamweight. She doesn't cut weight at all. In a recent interview, I forget who it was with now, um, but she was talking about how she doesn't cut weight at all. She just walks around at 135 pounds, and that's where she competes. So it's interesting that Nunes will once again have a size advantage and Valentina a little bit undersized here. In the first fight, Joe Rogan criticized Valentina for coming out and just playing defense early. She was just letting Nunes throw her looping shots and let her, letting her tire herself out. She was just not even countering, just purely playing defense. And Joe said that's not great for a three-round fight. And it really did come to bite her in the ass because she did win the third. But if she just goes with that same game plan here, if everything, do, everything would work out the same as it did the first time, it would be a great game plan to just let Amanda unload early, play defense, let her tire herself out so that Valentina could get the better of her later on. But now... After all this, let's talk about who my pick is. I'm picking Amanda Nunes via KO or TKO in round number two. I mentioned she's improved her cardio, she's improved her patience, and she has improved her striking dynamism. I don't think that Valentina will be able to make it through the, that huge striking combinations that Amanda's going to throw early. And then if Amanda were to hurt her in the, within the first 10 minutes, I think Amanda will be a little bit more patient, reserve a little bit more gas in her tank, and then be able to finish her a little bit later on. I'm picking officially Amanda Nunes via KO or TKO in round number two. Moving down the card, Yoel, the soldier of God, Romero versus Robert, Bobby Knuckles, he hates that nickname, the Reaper, Whitaker. The odds have, oh, I forgot to mention in the last fight, how crazy is it that Amanda Nunes is the underdog at plus 105 and Valentina Shevchenko is the favorite at minus 125. That's, to me, a little bit crazy, especially considering Nunes has already won this matchup. The odds for the co-main event, Robert Whitaker, minus 120. The comeback on Yoel Romero at plus 100. Of course, I want to talk about first is a lot of people like to talk about the style it's going to take to beat Yoel Romero. And that is a pressure fighter who throws a lot of volume and has pretty good cardio because some people think that Yoel gasses pretty hard. Robert Whitaker has the exact style that is prescribed to beat Yoel Romero, but I don't think that Yoel has as bad of cardio as a lot of people think. In his last fight against Chris Weidman, going into the third round, watching it live, I thought out of memory that Chris Weidman had clearly won the first two rounds, but that's not the case. If you look back at it, the judges had it one-to-one -one going into the third, Chris winning the first, Yoel winning the second, and then I watched it over, and that's truly the case. And then if you want to talk about how Yoel Perhaps he doesn't have great cardio. Going into the third round, he was the fresher fighter. Chris Weidman looked dejected and super tired going into the third. So perhaps it's a little bit of a myth that Yoel doesn't have great cardio. Yoel is extremely powerful, but he mostly throws one strike at a time, and he's mostly a counter puncher. Just look at like almost every single one of his finishes. It is a counter strike that seals the deal for him. Like Chris going in for a takedown, counter knee to Chris's face. That's how Yoel finished that one. Um, he's very patient. He almost gives away the first two rounds in order to have that explosivity 
still with him in the third round, and that's when he really looks for the finish. Most of his punches, if, when he leads, he's going to throw single strikes. He's a southpaw. He's going to throw the overhand left, straight left, a lot of uh, left body kicks power-wise, but a lot of it's just going to come single strikes at a time. Robert Whitaker, on the other hand, he's mostly a counter puncher as well, a counter striker, but he's going to be throwing punches in bunches. He might throw a one-two low kick and then throw a left hook as he's angling off from the striking combination, and he's more diverse and he throws with more volume and a little bit more fluidity than Yoel does when he's on his lead foot, when he's attacking. He will throw a one-two where Yoel's just going to be throwing single strikes at a time. I don't think Robert has the single strike power that Yoel does, but I think that his volume, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this pick, his volume, his output, his cardio, it's going to get the better of Yoel, even though I gave Yoel a break saying that maybe he doesn't have as bad a cardio as a lot of people think he has. I think he's going to fade late in round three, and Robert Whitaker is going to finish Yoel Romero via KO or TKO in round number four, but I'm not that confident in that um, at all because, I mean, geez, Yoel's one of these guys who every single time he fights, you could say the other person has better cardio than him, has a higher output, uses more of their skills than he does, but look, man, he doesn't lose fights. He just really does not lose fights, so perhaps... Yoel could get that third round knockout, but I just don't see it happening. I think uh, Robert Whitaker is going to overwhelm him. Last thing I forgot to touch on, Robert sometimes overextends himself and gets way ahead of his feet when he's throwing his combinations, and that could play right into Yoel's hands to, for Yoel to hit on takedown on him, but the get-up game of Robert Whitaker is so damn good, and he's, his balance is incredible. He's so quick. If we want to talk about youth advantage, Whitaker has a huge uh, age advantage, even though UL doesn't have that many MMA miles on him. I just, there's a lot of factors at play here, and I think Robert Whitaker is going to win the uh, fourth round KO or TKO. Your. Paris Brown says, How is Amanda the underdog? Caleb Parker, talking about beer. He's got Robert as well. Thank you so much for joining me, guys. Robbie Rapp just noticed you, man. Thanks for kicking it. Robbie Rapp has Whitaker in the second round by KO. Pure, unconscious Yoel, he says. All right. Moving on down the card, we've got Robbie, ruthless Robbie Lawler versus Donald Cowboy Cerrone. Robbie Lawler is 27-11 and 11 with one no contest. Donald Cerrone is 32-8 and 8 with one no contest. The odds favor Bob Lawler, minus 150, comeback on Donald Cerrone, plus 130. So you guys have been asking me about this fight for a long time, about the matchup. And originally I was saying I'm going to pick Bob Lawler because he possesses really good boxing up tight. And obviously Masvidal helped us see that that is Donald Cerrone's kryptonite. But then watching the film, Robbie doesn't often press forward. In fact, in his last two fights against Condit and then Tyron Woodley, he backed up most of the time he backed up and then got knocked out by Tyron Woodley he backed up and and just kind of eight kicks from Condit in the majority of their fight so that gave me some pause originally when the fight was scheduled I was going to pick Donald Cerrone because Robbie Lawler was coming back too quickly after getting knocked out by Tyron Woodley now Robbie has taken almost exactly a year off from getting knocked out by Tyron so I think he'll become he'll come back fresher and his chin should be fine here he's had enough time for his brain to recover and then I was like man the fight was going to happen quickly after Donald Cerrone got finished by Masvidal but he's taken almost exactly six months off from getting uh, finished by Masvidal and for Donald Cerrone in Donald Cerrone years that's like seven so that's a super long time for Donald Cerrone to sit out uh Robbie doesn't check a lot of kicks he eats a lot of kicks but why I'm still picking Robbie Lawler is Donald's hands aren't that fast, and when he tries to set up his kicks, he will often use his hands, or he will kind of linger with his hands down for a bit. And Robbie counters really hard with wide rights and overhand rights to opponents when they enter 
the phone booth with him. I think Donald will be throwing some low kicks, and Bob Lawler's going to – he could throw a left hook to the body. He's good at that. We know that Donald is weak to his liver side body. Robbie rips good hooks there. He also rips overhand rights and good hooks, wide rights with his right hand. And I think that that combination right there – is going to chew Donald Cerrone up. He stands super tall. I think he gets hurt to the body, and an overhand right is probably going to hurt him. I don't know if, if the fight will get finished. Donald could get those kicks out there, the snap kicks to the body, some high kicks to keep Robbie at range, but I just think eventually Robbie's going to find that body with a hook and then meet Donald's face with an overhand right. I think that Robbie will probably KO or TKO Donald late, but I might pick him the uh, decision. I'm not exactly sure yet. But the official pick for sure is Robbie Lawler to get it done. Moving down, Fabricio Vicavalo Verdum versus Alistair the Reem Overeem. The odds have Overeem at minus 130, the comeback on Fabricio Verdum at plus 110. Going back to the last fight, Caleb Parker has Cerrone by head kick, and so does Mike Alexander, head kick KO in the third. I honestly would rather Donald Cerrone to win. I really would. And when I was watching the film with Robbie mostly backing up, I, it's Donald could be able to keep distance on him with his kicks. I don't know. It's a tough one. The first, those two fights, the co-main and then Donald versus Lawler, are really tough to pick. But based on Robbie's, and also I think that Donald has, could take Robbie down if he's surprising enough with it. And then Donald has really good jujitsu. Just can't trust Donald against somebody who has really good boxing. So I got to go with Lawler. Delitzo Moni says, patient Overeem beats Verdum. That's my first point. These guys have fought twice prior to this, and this will be the third outing. It is one-to-one. Fabricio Verdum beat Reem back in pride with a Kimura. The second fight, Reem won via decision with a lot of flopping to his back did Fabricio Verdum. And Verdum thinks the reason why uh, Overeem won was because Overeem, well, he because Verdum was training too hard. He overtrained for, for Overeem the second fight. And then also Fabricio thinks that Alistair was uh, having a special breakfast. That's what he said in an interview with Karen Bryant for their second meeting because it was in Dallas, Texas. And we all know that the commission in Dallas, Texas is rather lackadaisical. So I kind of agree with him. But the point I want to make about since those fights, Fabricio has become this guy who's just super aggressive, way over aggressive, over pursued. Stipe Miocic got knocked out. And then against Travis Brown in his last fight, came out with that flying sidekick right away, was trying cartwheel kicks, just getting a little crazy in there. And Reem, since their last fight, has turned into a real tentative son of a gun. He will turn his back and run away from you, where Verdum will run toward you. And also, Verdum is very, very careful with his chin. Um, he's very calculated. And I think that Reem has got better with his striking since their last matchup. In their last matchup, Reem was only fighting out of a orthodox stance. Since that time, in his last fight against Hunt, he was fighting a lot out of a southpaw stance, and using overhand lefts and left kicks to the body that were really effective against Mark Hunt, where he would switch it quite a bit, and Hunt wasn't ready for it. Verdum has been training for this fight for two to three months, I think, but I don't know if he's going to be prepared for Reem coming out in a, in a different stance. And I think that Reem, because he's more calculated and Verdum is going to get a little wild and crazy in there, sure Verdum could catch that chin because... Verdum has gotten way better at striking since their second matchup as well. I mean, he showed off some real dynamism in two fights against Travis Brown and in his fight against Mark Hunt, where he knocked him out with a flying knee. But I think that Verdum's going to come forward too aggressive, and the patient, counterpunching Reem is going to knock Verdum out. But I see a lot of people picking Verdum via submission, and I, I don't get the thinking there. Reem is pretty good defensively, and if Verdum tries to flop to his back like he did in the last matchup, I think that Reem has some really good ground and pound, and he's going to hurt Verdum there. But my, I'm picking the Reem via knockout basically because he's the more patient guy. He's going to be counter-striking, and Verdum's going to come in there a little bit wild and crazy, and he's going to get caught with a maybe a wide right from Reem or perhaps 
a flying knee or something. Reem is really good in the clinch, so maybe when Verdum, he sometimes telegraphs his takedowns. I think perhaps Reem could meet his face with a knee, similar to Yoel versus Weidman. But anyway, I'm picking the counter-striking Reem to knock out Fabricio Verdum. I like both guys, so I don't want to see either guy lose, but I have to pick the Reem. Overeem ain't getting choked. The only way he's losing is if he gets tapped on the glass jaw. That's from Jesse Payne. I agree, man. I agree. I don't think... Yeah, man. Perfect, perfect uh, comment there. I really don't think Reem's going to get tapped. He does have a suspect chin, so... The wild and crazy Verdum coming forward could get the better of him, could touch that chin. But Ver, uh, Overeem has been so good and so calculated lately of defending that chin, literally running away when he thinks his chin might be in danger. Uh, I think he took a few shots from Hunt, which shows that his chin looks a little better than it had for a while there. And, uh, yeah, I just think the matchup really favors Overeem here. Moving down, first fight of the pay-per-view portion, Anthony Showtime Pettis versus Jim Miller. Pettis is 19-6, and six, Jim Miller is 28-9, and nine, and this is the first fight of this podcast where we're working our way down here that doesn't have the odds out yet. So for the rest of this preview video or podcast, we are making picks blind without odds. Jim Miller is being picked by Billy Johnson. Decent pick, Billy. First, I, there's a couple of things that I want to talk about with Anthony Pettis. So, his kryptonite is basically somebody pressing forward, pushing him against the fence like Guida did, like RDA did, like Eddie Alvarez did. And Jim Miller has a pressure kind of style. He can move forward really good, and he has decent takedowns. But Jim Miller doesn't do that sort of thing against the cage. Jim Miller is a wily veteran, so perhaps he would imp try to implement that game plan and push Pettis against the fence and grind on him there, which seems to be Pettis' kryptonite. Pettis, this is his first fight back at 155 pounds after uh, he had a short stint at 145 pounds. He went down and he beat Charles Oliveira, and then he lost to Max Blessed Holloway. But, and, he, and he missed weight against Holloway, so he wasn't eligible for that interim championship belt. But in those two fights, I saw a little bit of returned fire from Pettis. When he lost to Barboza and Alvarez and RDA, it seemed like he had lost a little bit of fire, a little bit of tenacity tenacity and he was kind of throwing single strikes but in his last fight against Holloway he was throwing well you know like when you think of a great dynamic striking combination don't you think that most of that combination is going to happen with the hands but Pettis against Holloway was throwing out multiple strike combinations all with kicks you know he would uh, do the three level thing inside low kick body kick and then a high kick all all in one strand and, and the the speed with which he was throwing was incredible on Jim Miller's side, he does press forward quite a bit. He does have the same kick that Pettis has. Miller fights out of a southpaw stance, and he does have the left body kick to the liver that Pettis is really, really known for. Pettis also has the kick from the orthodox stance. He hit Benson Henderson with a right body kick a bunch of times in a row, which got Benson to take him down, which inevitably got Pettis the victory via armbar off of his back. Jim Miller... He's not nearly as fast as Pettis. And if Pettis comes in with a little bit of fire, I don't think that his forward pressure and shots from open space, rather than against the fence, are going to be able to really threaten Pettis that much. I think it's going to be a close fight, but the speed and the dynamism with the lengthy kicks from Pettis, I really think gets the job done here. Um, I really think that the fight probably goes to a decision. Since Jim Miller has kind of overcame Lyme disease, he's looked better than ever, and he's He's tough and he's more gritty. So, like, when he got hurt to the body against Cerrone, I don't think that's going to affect him as much here. And where he fights out of the southpaw stance, like Pettis likes to do with that body kick, he's going to be able to protect his liver quite a bit, so the body shot won't be as effective here. But I think the, the speed of Pettis and his defensive submission game where Jim Miller's really, really good with his submissions. Pettis showed off really good submission defense in, his, in uh, two fights ago against Dubronx Oliveira. Dubronx had his back a couple of times. Pettis was able to fight it off. I don't think Jim Miller's going to submit him. 
and I think the speed of Pettis is going to get the job done here. And I'm going to pick Pettis via decision officially. Khalid Muhammad is, has Anthony by flying knee KO in the third round. Ricky Berghue says Pettis is overrated. Billy Johnson thinks Pettis is overrated. Mike Alexander thinks Miller is a bulldog and will overwhelm Pettis. Pettis, his counter-striking, and Miller is really good at pressing forward, pulling back to get a, a, a counter shot from or a strike from his opponent. So he pushes pulls to get a push from his opponent, and then he will counter with a combination there. But I don't think that his speed is enough to contend with Pettis. And like I said, sure, Pettis is a little bit washed up, and he's not what he used to be. He fought two former champions and, like, the fastest striker in the sport in Barboza. You know, RDA, Alvarez, two former champions, and Barboza, the fastest striker in MMA. Miller is none of those guys. So he's really taking a step down in competition here. He took a step down to beat Oliveira. He then went way to the top to fight Holloway. And now it's kind of mid-ground. I'm not disrespecting Jim Miller, but he's a not-ranked lightweight. You know, it's kind of a step down here. And Miller has more fight miles. He's older. He's slower. The speed and the fluidity with the kicks, I think, gets it done for Anthony Pettis here. Billy Johnson says Miller is a tough son of a bitch. And, yes, he certainly is. Pavel Vasilev, Vasilev is picking Miller via TKO. Holy moly. That's a pretty ballsy pick, man. I don't see it, but if it happens, I'll give you some props. Travis Hoppa Brown versus Alexi Olenek, the boa constrictor. This fight is rather simple. Olenek is going to press forward. He's going to put his uh, chest into Travis Brown's sternum. Look for some takedowns. Travis Brown is going to look to keep the fight at a distance with long, lengthy punches and snapping front kicks to the body and front kicks to the face as well. Travis Brown, 18-6-1. and, six and one. Olenek, 51-10-1. And, and Olenek has the most Ezekiel Choke victories in UFC history. I believe it's with two. Holy mother effing. Caleb Parker thinks Travis Brown is going to get dominated. Matt Ghost says Brown goes down in the first via sub. I don't think so, man. Travis Brown has been fighting high level of competition for a while. He nearly should have beat Derek the Black Beast Lewis. He has 83% takedown defense against some of the best guys in the world. Sure, Olenek is a really, really high-level grappler, but he struggled to get Daniel Olmielanchuk to the ground. Travis Brown is going to post with two legs really wide. Olenek's going to hang his head out to the side, and Travis Brown is going to knee, or Travis Brown elbow him in the temple. I'm picking Travis Brown via KO or TKO in... Ooh. Round number two. Early round number two. Olenek needs to get the fight to the ground. Needs to. Travis Brown has phenomenal takedown defense. He should be able to keep the fight at range with front kicks, uh, lengthy jabs, crosses. And um, then if Olenek, Olenek looks to get the fight to the ground against the fence, and that is where Brown is really dangerous with his takedown defense and those Travis Brown elbows to the temple. So I'm picking Travis Brown via Travis Brown elbows to the temple in round number two. Chad, the disciple, Laprise versus Brian Mantis Camozzi. So uh, Chris or Chad Laprise is taking this fight on kind of short notice. He's replacing. I need to look at my notes. He's replacing Alan Joban, but. Laprise got the call about a month prior to the fight, so it's not really on short notice. Um, but Laprise is moving up to 170 pounds. He did win Tough Nations at 170 pounds. He spent his first five fights at 170 pounds. And his last fight against Thibaut Goaty, which was scheduled for 155 pounds, he missed weight. And he weighed in at 159 pounds, so he was over the limit there. Um, and Brian Camozzi, he's a long, tall welterweight but he's not very thick he's not very filled out so he's Kamozi is four inches taller and he has a seven inch reach advantage but he's he's pretty bean poly so it's not like he's going to have a huge size advantage on Chad Laprise here Kamozi has been training full-time in mixed martial arts since he got out of high school which is a, 
that's pretty damn crazy right there. He's a pretty dynamic striker, um, and he's pretty well-rounded as well. But he's he's not good defensively at anything. He doesn't have good head movement. He doesn't have great takedown defense. But off of his back, he's really good at attacking with submissions off of his back. Um, and while he is diverse and he does throw his strikes pretty fluidly, he's not that quick. And Chad Laprez is a, a way better kickboxer than Brian Camozzi. I, I think. And uh, Camozzi, if you look at his UFC.com, it lists him as durable. He's not that durable, man. Randy Brown, and this is a little bit of MMA math, but Randy Brown, he's got a shitload of potential, right? He's a long dude, kind of like John Jones, but he's not great at, at the moment. And he wasn't great when he fought Chris Camozzi, but uh, Brian Camozzi. But he hurt Camozzi on the feet with some long strikes, and then he hurt him with a knee. Uh, and I don't trust the chin of Camozzi. A lot of people like to mention how Laprise is a little bit suspect with his chin as well. But I think the speed and the diversity with which Chad Laprise throws his strikes and counter strikes, nonetheless, there too. Camozzi's going to be moving forward. Is going to be throwing some blitzing striking combinations, and Laprise is going to counter him and hurt him, and then Camozzi is going to back off and then go against the fence, and Laprise is going to finish with a, you know, like a five punch combination or whatever when Camozzi is hurt against the fence, and I think it'll happen in round number two. Mostly, my pick is because Laprise hits really hard. He's super diverse. He's pretty flashy with his striking, and Camozzi is lackluster with his defense. He doesn't have nearly any head movement. Um, and I don't think he'll have enough takedown defense to get Chad Laprise to the ground. Laprise showed in the Tough Nations finale against Olivier Oban Mercier that he has some pretty damn good takedown defense. And even if Camozzi were to take the fight, try to take the fight there, I don't think he's going to do that well for him. I expect Chad Laprise to be like a minus 200 favorite here. Kayla Parker says Chad's getting better each fight, more dynamic now than ever. And I, I should mention, whoops. I should have mentioned that because he's coming up in weight class, even though it's sort of short notice, he had a lot of quickness and fluidity at 155 pounds. At 170 pounds against a guy who's not that much larger than him, I think he'll have more snap to his kicks, more snap to his punches, uh, be able to carry his power into the later rounds more if it needs to go there. And I just think that pretty much everything points toward Chad Laprise getting this victory. Moving on down... Daniel Umielanchuk versus Curtis Razor Blades. Umielanchuk is a Muay Thai kickboxer first and foremost. And if you just look at his body type, it's surprising that he moves with the fluidity and the quickness and the body control that he does. It's really, really impressive. He's the number 15 heavyweight in the world, and Curtis Razor Blades is not ranked. Curtis Blades is 7-1. and one. When he made his UFC debut against Francis Ngannou, which is where he got his one loss via doctor stoppage, he made it to the UFC without a coaching staff, without coaches. What? So he lost to Ngannou, and since that fight, he decided to move somewhere to get really good coaching. So he moved to Muscle Farm, uh, Team Muscle Farm or whatever, now they're Team Elevation, and he's training with a bunch of good guys. And he's shown a lot of improvement since moving to that camp. He mostly wants to wrestle. So we've got kind of striker versus grappler here. And Curtis Blades, in his fight against Cody East, got hurt a lot, a lot, a lot. And I question his durability. But really, Omiel Anchuk, let me look. I forgot to pull this shit up. I think that most of Omiel Anchuk's victories are via decision. Uh... Most of Daniel Omielanchuk's victories are via submission. Very few via knockout. Um, he hasn't... He beat Chris De La Hocha via KO, TKO in 2015. Um, I don't think that Omielanchuk is going to be quick enough, powerful enough to hold off Curtis Blaze. As Curtis Blaze is going to come forward, look to get in some takedowns, look for some ground and pound. I don't think that while... Blades is moving forward to get in on those hips, get that takedown, maybe a body slam like he did in his last fight a bunch of times. I don't think Omiel Anchuk is going to knock him out on the way in. I think that Blades is going to be able to take him down. We've seen this fight similarly already for Omiel Anchuk. He fought Timothy Johnson in his last fight, and he lost the decision. He couldn't keep Timothy Johnson off of him. 
Razor Blades is eight years younger than Omi Lanchuk. He's getting better and better every fight. He think he's more physically imposing than Timothy Johnson. Again, a little bit of MMA math, but I think Razor Blades is going to move forward, take him down really early, and then ground and pound KO or TKO Omi Lanchuk either in the first round or early on in round number two. Let's move down the fight card to a welterweight fight between Jordan, Young Gun Mian, and Belal, remember the name Muhammad. So, before, well, there's, I have to pull up some notes here quickly, guys. Sorry for the, okay, there are three things that really worry me about Jordan Mian. One is he's already retired from mixed martial arts once. That's not good. Uh, I think he trains with just his dad or something. So, at a, not, there, if you look at his camp, there's no notable names at his, fight camp and I think that his dad or something is his main coach so that's not good either and then in his last fight against oh there's another intangible in his last fight against Emil Meek Mech, he uh, gassed super early like after about six minutes of competition Jordan Mean gassed hard as fuck so that's not good and then the fourth thing is that against Mech Mech like broke his ribs or some shit early on in the fight was screamed in pain and Jordan Mean didn't show the fight IQ to attack that area of his body so a lot going wrong for Jordan Meehan. Belal, remember the name Muhammad, kind of the opposite of Jordan Meehan in his fight camp. Belal trains at Rufus Sport and Valle Flow Striking um, in Milwaukee. And he's getting better every fight. In his last fight, I believe it was against Randy Brown, he had really effective head movement. When he made his UFC debut against Alan Joban, he had no head movement whatsoever. But then against Randy Brown, even when he was marching Brown down, moving forward, he had really good head movement. And Belal has been, if you look at his social media, he's been training wrestling a lot. And he's been, uh, he had the opportunity to train some grappling with Habib the Eagle Nurmagomedov. While Habib is officially one weight class below him, I think that is a great person to train your your grappling skills with. And Muhammad showed some decent uh, grappling skills against Randy Brown. But I really still don't think that Muhammad is great defensively, even though he showed good head movement against Brown. I think that Jordan Meehan, being the more diverse striker here, should be able to come out and hurt and probably knock out Bellal early. But I question Jordan's I really question Jordan's uh, cardio, but if you again, if you look at Jordan's social media, he's been working a lot on his grappling and his strength and conditioning. I think that he maybe is taking this fight seriously, not just looking for a paycheck. He decided to train hard in his uh, strength and conditioning, and he'll come out here, and I think that he'll be a little bit more conditioned than he was in his last fight, and I'm picking Jordan Meehan via first round K or TKO, and if not, I think that he might have the endurance to at least win the second round, probably lose round number three. But as Caleb Parker is saying, Muhammad could possibly pick him apart if Mian gets tired or if Belal decides to use some of his wrestling. And maybe Muhammad's striking defense has vastly improved since he's been working at Rufus Sport with guys like Mike Biggie Rhodes. Uh, Duke Rufus is the coach there, you know, getting way better with his striking. And in fact, I almost talked myself into picking Belal Muhammad. I'm going to reserve the right to change my pick on this fight until a little bit later on down the road. But right now, my pick is Jordan Meehan via first round KO or TKO. Moving on down the line. Rob Font versus Douglas Silva de Andrade de Silva. Rob Font is 13-2. and two. Douglas Silva de Andrade is 24-1 and one with one no contest. Font is the longer guy. He's one inch taller and he has a three inch reach advantage. And Font is also the more diverse fighter. Since he lost to uh, John Lineker, I feel like Rob Font has made improvements to his game. Even though he fought Schnell in his last fight, and Schnell was coming up from 125 pounds, I feel like Rob showed some improvements. He, sh he showed some diversity. He's shown some uh, wrestling ability. And I think it was really good for Schnell to get that fight, or it was really good of Font to get that fight against Schnell because coming off that loss where he got pretty dominated by Lineker, he probably needed to get his confidence back. So to get a quick victory against Schnell, that's phenomenal for him. 
Douglas Silva de Andrade reminds me a lot, not a lot, a lot, but he reminds me a little bit of Yoel, Soldier of God Romero, in that his movements are not necessarily herky-jerky, but he's very reserved for a while, and then all of a sudden he will just throw some super-duper explosive shit out at you, and he saves his energy to the later rounds uh, when he's basically defended a little bit, made his opponent whiff at air, and then he'll turn the volume up in round two and three. Uh, D'Andrage trains with the, the Pitbull brothers, Patricky and Patricio, um, and if you just look at the stats, it's clear that Font is going to have a volume advantage, but Silva D'Andrage is going to have a power advantage. Spinning back fists, spinning back kicks to the body, Dennis Seaver style, you know. But Font, I think that he throws with more fluidity. He will throw with more volume. He will throw a 1-2 low kick, which could really, I mean, just throwing a combination could get Silva D'Andrage off of his game. And then when Font starts to mix up some takedowns in there, it's going to confuse Silva D'Andrage. And I think that Font is going to win a decision with his diversity uh, in you know mixing up his striking with his grappling and also with his pressure forward, his pace, and his output. But if there is a fight, if there's a bigger chance of one of the fighters to get a finish, it is D'Andrage. He's more likely to finish Rob Font. First fight of the night, which is happening on UFC Fight Pass beginning at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time, Tiago de Lima Marreta Santos versus Gerald Mearshart. So, of course, first of all, Santos hits like a truck, especially with his kicks, but he really needs space to get off with those kicks. Um, his best weapon is a roundhouse kick from his southpaw stance, which he likes to throw it high, and he'll also throw it to the body. He trains with ATT, which is a great camp, and his coaches believe in his skills, then that he's grown with his skills, and based on his past performances, I think that Mearshart should have a clear advantage on the ground, but I listened to some interviews, and I've read some shit, and I think that Santos's cornermen believe that he could hang if the fight goes to the ground. Obviously, that's not going to behoove him to let the fight go to the ground because Mearshart has the majority of his victories via submission. So we've got striker versus grappler here, but on the other side of the fence, Gerald Mearshart, he only has been to a decision three times in his 34-fight career, and he's never been finished by KO or TKO. In his UFC career, he has two fights and two submissions with zero official takedowns, which is just bonkers. Technically, I think, though, that he did take down Joe Gigliotti with a judo throw but in his UFC debut, but for some reason it didn't count. He is a southpaw, so the left strong kick from Santos will be a little bit less effective, so he'll be guarding his body a little bit more, fighting out of the southpaw stance. His, uh, his liver will be more difficult to get to from Santos, and his right hand will be closer to his face to uh, defend the left high kick from Santos. He's deceptively quick with his uh, left straight, and he sometimes will throw it naked or throw it uh, in combination, so he's pretty diverse with his striking. Man, if the fight hits the mat, I don't believe in Santos' cornerman being right that he could hang with Gerald Mearshart there. I think it goes to the ground, and Mearshart's going to submit him right away. But Mearshart doesn't have great striking defense. I think that Santos could land that high kick, but Mearshart's going to be pressing forward, really taking that strike away from Santos. And uh, so we, the, I, my pick really is the fight does not go the distance. Mearshart in 34 fights, he's only been to the judges three times. The left high kick from Santos could land. Uh, I'm tentatively going to pick Santos via left high kick. He's shown some ability to defend takedowns. Um, he, sh he got rocked in his, in his, I think it was his last fight against Jack Marshman. So maybe Gerald could beat him there. My, my intuition is telling me to pick Mearshart via submission, but something tells me that Santos is going to win via left high kick to the dome, sending the fight to the canvas and getting uh, probably a second round KO or TKO. So that does it for my picks. Running back through Nunez, Whitaker, Lawler, Overeem, Pettis, Brown, Laprise, Blades, Meehan, Font, and Santos. Prediction for fight of the night is going to go to... Uh, it's probably going to go to Lawler versus Cerrone. Performance bonuses, predictions are going to be Alistair, Overeem, and... 
Robert Whitaker. So that does it for my predictions. Uh, let's move on to the next section of the podcast. Caleb Parker, forgot to mention this comment. The fight will be closer than people think, but I got font via decision or early stoppage. Yeah, I think it'll be close. It was a tough one for me to pick, but I've got font. So I'm excited to see the odds. It sucks that they're not out yet. But, um, yeah, so those are my picks. Let's go to the next section, which I like to call Geeked Outside of Mixed Martial Arts. Basically, in the past seven days, I've been geeking out about, oh, lots of different things. I'm into craft beer making, I'm into bonsai trees, and I'm into computers. I've been mostly researching beer lately. So I recently learned how to make a Scottish ale. been really doing some research on that. That's going to be a lot of fun. I I saw one of my old friends from high school this last weekend, and he likes I, – he, I picture him as this redneck guy who loves – Coors Light, Bush Light, Bud Light, you know, that type of thing. And he told me that right now his favorite, his favorite beer in the world is a craft beer Scottish ale. And I'm like, holy shit. So um, I didn't realize he liked craft beer, so I'm going to hang out with him soon. And I'm going to make a Scottish ale to be like, hey, check this shit out. It's not as good as what you like probably, but I'm going to make it. So um, if, you, if you're interested at all, the malt bill, it's going to have some Caramel 120 in it. I'm going to put some... Uh, just a dash of roasted barley in it and I think the biggest factor that's going to play in here is I'm going to mash it at 160 degrees which should leave uh, which should leave some residual sweetness in the beer and then I'm going to use a Scottish ale yeast that I think should be a low attenuation which means it'll leave some residual sugar in it again so this beer overall is going to be a little bit um, a, a lot of bit sweet I'm going to get, do some late hopping so that it smells like a, a nice beer. I'm going to give it like some earthy hops so that a lot of Scottish ales or wee heavies, they, are, they have a, a strong earthy character to them. So I'm going to use some late hops that have an earthy character to them. Uh, maybe some, oh, I don't know, off the top of my head, Willamette or Czech Saz I think might be a good one to go with. But anyway, so that's going to be a lot of fun. Making beer and and tasting beer and doing all kinds of shit like that. I just kegged a uh, beer that I made last week. It's the sixth installment of one I've been making, obviously six times now for, you know, I brew every other week. So, I don't know, about three months I've been making this one beer. So that's going to be fun. I can taste that in the sixth installment. It gets better and better every time. It started out as a, a blonde ale that I wanted to give some extra nose to some extra smell, some citrusy floral hop character. So I made a blonde, but then I added extra car caramel 40, so it's a little bit darker than a blonde, but it has blonde IBU. But then I put like five ounces of hops uh, in the last five minutes that really give it a strong nose at the end. And I'm debating calling it mullet because up front, it's got this bitterness that rolls over your tongue early, and then late, it's sweet. So got that... Bitter up front, sweet in the back, like a mullet, you know, party in front, business in the back, or no, business up front, party in the back, that type of thing. I don't know. It's stupid. And then for bonsai trees, last week I bought four different bonsai tree seeds and I planted them and uh, they started germinating. I had one spring up today. It was, uh, it's a Colorado pine, I believe it is. And I also got a Jacaranda Mimorosa, which is a, a purple tree, and I got a flame tree, which is a Delonix Regia, and then I got a um, Norway Spruce. So I'm looking forward to those popping up and then turning them into uh, bonsai trees. I put like eight seeds of each in there, so hopefully I get enough sprouting up that I can split them out and then have multiple trees of them to see how, uh, you know, do some, do some different things with each one. If you didn't know already, bonsai trees are just any type of tree that you just purposely purposefully dwarf so you put it in small pots and you trim the roots and you, uh, you can wire the tree so it bends certain ways it's gonna be a lot of fun Delitzo Moni says uh, they want to try some of my beer someday hopefully I have a brewery maybe I can ship to wherever you are I don't know where you're from but anyway so that basically does it for the show normally I have a section number two which is about news but um, 
I didn't really have time to look up news yet. I'm sorry I'm a day late on the podcast. I wanted to get my picks for UFC 213 laid down. I needed an extra day to do the research on them. Um, And for the people who are criticizing the show and how it's ran, because I got the same background every time, um, I'm just me talking, I I think that's what the show is going to continue to be. I want to engage with you guys more and talk to you more. Tonight, I didn't do as good a job of that because... I was having some anxiety prior to the start of the show, to be honest with you, so my my motor's just running a little bit quick. Um, but, yeah, I want to engage with you guys and just chat during the show. And but So this is what the show is going to be. This is Fight Nerds. You can subscribe on, on MMA Mania SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, Podcast Addict, uh, Zencast, Player FM, iVoodoo, all that stuff. And so, yeah, that's it. Thank you guys so much for joining me. I'll let you get out of here now. 21 of you stayed here till the end. I really appreciate all of you. I really appreciate everything you guys have done for me. Please like my Facebook page. That would I would really make my day if you did. I'm hoping to get to 500 by the end of July. Probably not going to get there, but I'm setting the goal anyway. And um, I'll be back. It'll probably be next Monday doing, this, doing the next episode of Fight Nerds, which will be picking you uh, – the Ultimate Fighter Season 25 finale. I'll, I'll do my picks on next week's show, and hopefully I can have some news for you guys. Donnie Smith, thanks for hanging out. You take care too, my friend. And, uh, yeah, guys, I'll see you next Monday. Namaste.